we've got an 07 Hyundai Santa Fe with a 2.7 engine. Now the customer came in and said that the check engine light is on and it's been on for about two years and they've taken it to three different shops and they've all done some things and charged her some money for it but as soon as she leaves if within about five miles the check engine light comes back on. This is not much information yet. What are some assumptions that you might be tempted to make at this early point that could hinder your focus on the problem? Well, one is whoever worked on this before didn't know what they're doing. Well, that's a pretty negative approach. You don't know that, and perhaps they did actually fix a problem, just not this problem. Remember, you don't know the past, and you couldn't change it if you did. So focus on what you need to know. Look for evidence. Now this customer also takes pretty good care of their vehicle and they've actually got one of these service logs where they've written down in it all the things they've done since they've had the vehicle. As you can see we've got over 154,000 miles on this car. So let's look over the history. So I can see about 75,000 miles they replaced the timing belt and the serpentine belt. We've got several oil changes and some brake work. We've got a CV boot that's been replaced about 120,000 miles. At about 115,000 miles they did a tune-up and replaced a coil. And at about 140,000 miles they replaced the intake gasket. Now that was in relation to their first time they took this to a place to have it fixed. They don't have it written down in here but she told me at the second place they replaced the mass airflow sensor. Now we're sitting at about 154,000 miles with the complaint. Now that gives us a little bit of an edge because we can look back and see if something that should have been done has been and whether or not that might be contributing to this problem. Now whenever we have a check engine light, the first thing we're going to do is hook up the scanner, look for codes and see what we can find. So let's get started. So we've scanned it and we've got two codes. P2187, fuel system too lean at idle. P2189, System 2 Lean Idle Bank 2. Okay, so we've got some information. An 07, 154,000 miles, some things have been done to it. It's got codes now for Lean at Idle. Code P2187, Fuel System 2 Lean at Idle, and code P2189, System 2 Lean on Bank 2. There's two different codes here, so do we have two different lean problems? No, not really. As you check the service manual, you'll see that P2187 is for bank 1 and P2189 is for bank 2. Now this is really a good thing because it means that we only have one problem, but it's affecting both banks. Now the computers in these cars these days are pretty good at trying to narrow down the problem. And our codes are indicating that we've got a lean problem at idle. Not above idle, but only at idle. Notice that both codes identify at idle. Well, what does this prove that the problem is not, and why? Well, it proves that it's not a fuel delivery problem. Not the fuel pump, not the fuel pressure regulator, and not the injectors. Let me explain why. So as we think about this, oftentimes when we have a lean code, we're thinking about an air leak of some kind. Now if it's at idle, if you understand how it works, when you're above idle, the throttle plate is open and you're bringing in a lot of air. But at idle, the throttle plate is closed and there's a very controlled amount of air. And that's when we're lean. That's when we're setting our code. So we know this. With the throttle plate closed, you have your minimum airflow but your maximum vacuum. And with the throttle plate open, you have your maximum airflow but your minimum vacuum. The PCM's job is to keep the air fuel mixture balanced. Let's picture a teeter totter. Now you know a teeter totter is basically a balance beam. So let's put the PCM in the middle to control it. Now that PCM has to receive an input and it gets from the O2 sensor which is the air side and then calculates and commands the fuel injector which is the fuel side. It should be balanced but it's not. Remember we've set a code. We're stuck lean. We have more air than fuel because we have a lean code.
Now, if we were stuck the other way, we would have set a rich code because we would have had less air than fuel and set a rich code. But we have a code for lean at idle. Sure, this could be because of too little fuel that would still be lean, but it could not be because we have too much fuel because that would have been a rich code. So we have a code for lean at idle, more air than fuel at idle. Now remember this, this is a closed throttle and this is idle. So you have a very controlled amount of air entering the intake chamber. And if we had any amount of fuel change, either positive or negative, it would have affected both banks of the engine. And it is, we have a code at idle. And the other side of this is an open throttle. This is any acceleration where we would have a maximum amount of air coming into the intake. And again, if we had any amount of fuel change, either positive or negative, it would affect both banks of the engine. But it's not. It's not affecting both banks, and we have no code above idle. So this proves that it's not the fuel pump, fuel pressure regulator, or the fuel injectors. So we don't need to waste time checking them. The PCM has set codes for idle only. It could have set codes for lean and not designated idle, but it didn't. So if we'd have had any kind of a fuel delivery issue, it would have affected idle as it did, but it also would have affected above idle, but it didn't. So we can't have a fuel delivery issue. We also know that it's not the mass airflow sensor. Why? For the same reasons. It's the same airstream. So if we had any amount of air change rather than fuel change, either positive or negative, it would affect both banks of the engine. And it would have affected idle as it did, but it would have also affected any range of acceleration and set a code that did not specifically indicate idle. So what do we know? We know we are looking for an air leak. So the first thing we did after taking off the engine cover was to look around and listen and see if we can see anything very obvious. A lot of times vacuum lines are off or collapsed or rotted or have a crack in it. We couldn't visually see anything and we couldn't hear anything. So now it's time to test. Sure, there are multiple ways to locate an air leak. How would you choose to do it? So we're going to interject some propane. You know propane is a fuel. So we're going to open up our bottle of propane and we've got this wand. The wand has a valve we can open up too, and I like to listen to it to make sure I can hear the propane coming out, or you can smell it. Now what we want to do is just wave this all over the engine and watch the short-term fuel trim and see if we see a change. So why would you choose to watch the short-term fuel trim rather than the O2 sensor? If you watch the O2 sensor and it does change, that tells you that the O2 sensor did respond, but you still don't know if the PCM made any adjustments. The short-term fuel trim changes based on the response from the O2 signal. So by watching the short-term fuel trim data, you're confirming that the O2 change occurred and the PCM has calculated and is attempting to make changes to balance the air-fuel mixture. Now, a place that we usually suspect is anytime there's a vacuum line or a lot of times around the intake gasket. So this is just kind of a quick test. We're just going to pop it around here and see if we see anything changing. Follow your intake. Sometimes around the injectors. Sometimes with this wand, you can stick it down underneath the intake to get the underside. Any place you see a vacuum line, you might think I'm moving kind of fast, but it should be pretty instantaneous. That computer can adjust fuel fast. Go around to the back side. The whole time we're watching the scanner fuel trim. Go around by the brake booster. Virtually anywhere air could be leaking into the intake. Now we're looking at the short term on bank one, 
we're zoomed in so that you can see it well, but we're actually watching both banks. If I have propane sneaking into the intake, it should go through the combustion process, go out the oxygen sensor, it should see it, and the computer should start adjusting fuel. But as you can see, as we're going all over this intake, we've got no adjustment. The propane test showed no signs of an air leak, so we really don't have an air leak, do we? So our propane test didn't turn up any evidence. What would you do next? Take some time to think about and discuss your options. So since our propane test really didn't show anything to start with, we're going to back that up with the smoke test. We're going to turn our smoke machine on. And now we have to be able to put smoke inside the intake. So we've got a direct intake port here. I'm going to take that vacuum line off. I'm going to test my smoke machine. And you see it's putting out smoke. So now I'm going to put that in the vacuum line and we're going to smoke the engine. Now the smoke is going to fill everything inside the engine and if there's a leak the smoke should come out. Now if you've never done this, sometimes with the smoke machine it can take some time to fill the whole system with smoke under pressure. So you need to let it run for a while and then just start looking for smoke to escape. So of course the places to look are any place that the intake is bolted down in case you have a gasket leak, any place that there's vacuum lines, So this system should be completely sealed, where air comes in through the air ductwork, goes through the filter, passes past the mass airflow sensor, goes into the throttle body and into the intake. So any air into this intake should be seen and measured by the mass airflow. So if you look right here, you can see some smoke escaping. Now we're zoomed in pretty close. Let's back off so you can see where we're at. Now if you're using a smoke machine, often it's very helpful to have a pretty bright light. It'll help that smoke show up. So you can see the smoke leaking from there. Now this is one indication and a pretty good indication that we've got a leak right there. Since smoke, which is under pressure, is being pumped out when we turn the smoke off, air could be sucked into that same hole. So our smoke machine is showing us a place where there's a very good chance there's a leak. Why didn't the propane test show that the first time? So why didn't the propane test show us this leak? It was my fault, not the propane's. I was moving too fast and missed the spot of the leak because it was pretty small. The point is to trust your knowledge. If the results don't produce what you thought it should, double check and be sure. Let's do our propane test again, but this time let's do it a little bit more accurately. The first time we did the propane test, we were kind of just generally going all over the engine to see if anything big popped up. Nothing did. So we went to our smoke test and it re did reveal a spot where there could be a leak. So now I'm going to go back and do the propane test again, but I'm going to be a lot more precise where I actually place it. So I've got my propane bottle turned on. And I'm going to take this little wand and put it right on where we think the leak is, where the smoke showed us that there was a leak. Now as I do this, look at your short-term fuel trim. Now keep your eye on the short-term fuel trim, which is the bottom graph. Now you can see a sudden and an instant change when I get put propane there. So my short term suddenly went down. Now it's trying to correct. The computer's trying to adjust. But look at my long term. We've come down to 16. Coming way back down. This one's trying to correct. We're trying to get this one down as far as it can. 
Now let me turn the propane off. When I turned the propane off, my short term went back up into the 20s. And this side you can see it as well. Now look at my long term. It's climbing back up again. Because now I've got the air leak again. I have not filled that air with fuel. We've just got a direct air leak. We're seeing it instantly with short term and we're confirming it with the long term over time. Now you can see short term is stabilized and long term is here, but if, the longer we watch this, you're going to see the long term begin to climb back up. Now keep in mind we're still at idle. The long term tried to stabilize it. So now it's still adjusting it up and we're going closer and closer to the 25% again. Now let me just confirm this by adding propane one more time. Now you tell me when you think I'm adding the propane. Our short term reacted instantly and our long term is reacting as well to confirm the problem. Notice our oxygen sensors. As soon as I added the propane, we went rich. We started pulling fuel away, short term and long term. Then I turned the propane off. As soon as I turn it off, we go lean with the oxygen sensor and our short term is now adding fuel and so is the long term. For your own learning experience, review this section of the video a few times and watch how interrelated the O2 short term and long term fuel trims are to each other. So by using our information, understanding how the system works, using the scanner and the lab scope, tracking down the evidence, we can find now that we've actually found the source of the leak. Now it's time to take it apart and see what's causing it and what it's going to take to fix it.